The Earth's North Pole is our next final frontier. Although before we're trouncing around the Earth's molten core itself, I don't think we'll reach the final, final frontier. The Arctic is home to vast stores of hydrocarbons and mineral wealth. It's the shortest flight path between the US and Russia for missiles, and between China and Europe for shipping. And as climate change melts the ice walls that have for so long kept us out of the Arctic, its importance only grows. I'm Joel, this is Debate Track, and here is your September topic, Militarization of the Arctic. Okay, before we begin, three notes on housekeeping. First, all evidence cited here can be found at our website, debatetrack.com, for a low fee of $10 a month. This fee helps to keep these lectures free for everyone. If you plan on purchasing the brief, I recommend following along with it during the lecture to familiarize yourself with the cards. Second, I need people to help me cut cards. I'm paying $4 a page. Please send me an email for more details. Last, a free PF intro class. I highly recommend it if you're new to PF. It's on August 26. Sign up in the link in the description, and if that date is in the past, I will link to a recording of said class for posterity's sake. Now, on to your topic. But, before we really begin, please note that the evidence quoted in this lecture, and there will be a lot of it, is cut in the same way as in debate rounds, and therefore will omit some sections, and therefore won't match the evidence exactly as it's written. Now, the Arctic itself is a giant region, and in the center of a great many places, and therefore, understanding the, ge the geography, the countries involved, and the status quo of the law is a necessary starting place. Let's dive in directly to maps. So you may be familiar with the fact that Earth is a globe, and that most maps, including the global map on Google Maps, deals with the issue of projecting a globe onto a rectangle by stretching out dimensions of any part whose circumference is less than the equator. So equatorial regions are more or less accurate, but the further north or south you go, the more distorted the map becomes. And this is called the Mercator projection, the one that we are most used to. So while Russia and Greenland are actually huge, they're not nearly as huge as pictured here. Likewise, Antarctica in the south is actually roughly the size of Europe. But pictured here, it looks like the rest of the continents put together. It is comically large. Now, there are many ways to map the globe onto a plane. Each of these projections is just one of those ways. Yet none of them is accurate because the Earth isn't actually any of these shapes. Instead, each projection makes a trade-off in distorting shapes, areas, distances, or directions. Even the Mercator projection is useful because although it distorts uh, sizes of places, it honestly represents angles and shapes of the land. To think about the sizes of land masses more accurately, the mole-wide projection is a great option. So here you can see, again, Greenland, Russia, big, but not half as big as were, uh, as in the Mercator projection. Uh, for the bulk of the geography portion of this lecture, I will be using Mercator as these stretched out areas makes places easier to visualize, along with the polar projections that don't suffer from the same level of distortion. But just as a note, this is the map that comes much closer to the sizes of the land. Next, uh, the Arctic and the Antarctic. The Earth's two poles share some similarities. Uh, they're both cold, they're both polar, both harsh and inhospitable, both ice-covered, and both places few people go for vacation. However, they have many differences. Antarctica is a large landmass, and therefore the seventh continent. In due time, people may live there. It's land. Uh, it's surrounded by few countries, as you can see on the map, although the southern tip of South America, Australia, and New Zealand all come close. Penguins live in Antarctica, along with uh, other parts of the Southern Hemisphere. The Arctic Sea, on the right, our topic of conversation, is an ice-covered sea, which means when it melts, only water will be left, not land. It's fully ringed by countries, notably Russia and Canada, 
But other countries, including the USA, have territory within the Arctic Circle. Polar bears and Santa Claus live in the Arctic. Although we won't talk about Antarctica, a fair amount of evidence references developments in both regions and how geopolitical interactions affect countries' relations to both poles. So here is a quote from Sachs and Black 22. They say, quote, If Arctic governance is in trouble, the Antarctic could follow, end quote. Okay, now geography proper. We will start with the waters around the Arctic Sea, uh, then look at the regions and uh, that border the sea, starting in the U.S. and ending in Russia. So, starting with the passages, the northern passages, uh, these are routes that ships can take through the Arctic. There are two of them, the Northwest Passage, which goes primarily through the Canadian archipelago, and the Northeast Passage, uh, which primarily follows Russia's coast. So these are the two. The Northern Sea Route is sometimes used interchangeably with the Northeast Passage, but refers specifically to the portion of the passage that's controlled by Russia and lies in Russia's exclusive economic zone. Let's talk about the Northwest Passage. Uh, this passage has historically seen a number of complete transits, but the transits are typically for exploration or scientific purposes or just as an adventure. Um, as the harsh conditions, the excessive ice, and uh, navigation through the Canadian archipelago makes it impractical. In ideal conditions, the Northwest Passage may cut several days off the trip from Asia to America's East Coast, but for now, the Suez Canal uh, is the route of choice. That is the canal, uh, I'm sorry, not the Suez, the Panama Canal, which goes through Panama and South America, um, yeah, is the route of choice. Next, the Northeastern Sea Route is more impressive, uh, both in its history of transits and its future potential for shipping. The route was used extensively during the Cold War, and a combination of melting ice and infrastructure development led to 85 ships sailing through the Northern Sea Route bearing various kinds of cargo at its peak. Uh, this number will likely grow steeply in the future, especially given the large time that can be saved on a trip from Asia to Europe by cutting out the Suez Canal. So. Suez Canal uh, through the Middle East, uh, Panama Canal through South America. Last, the Transpolar Sea Route um, is a hypothetical future sea route where ships can cut directly across the Arctic. This is currently not possible due to the polar uh, ice caps just, you know, taking their sweet time and melting. Watts 19 says that, quote, by 2035, the Arctic is forecast to be free of ice during summer, which will allow ships to sail across the North Pole." Unquote. Okay, now on to specific regions, starting in Alaska. Alaska, of course, being the largest U.S. state, in what is, is what makes the U.S. an Arctic nation. Uh, from Forsyth 18, who talks about the importance of Alaska, quote, Alaska is the most strategic place on Earth, stated Brigadier General Billy Mitchell. The state is singularly closer to many national capitals in the hemisphere than many points in the lower 48 states. This makes Alaska the perfect power projection platform for the U.S. from a military standpoint. While Alaska is critical to inter intercontinental shipping now, emerging routes due to shrinking ice impediments could raise the state's economic statures to e even greater heights. End quote. While strategically important, Alaska is sparsely populated with under a million people total and minimally developed, with the U.S. lacking an Arctic deep water port that could accommodate large ships like oil tankers, uh, loaded, air, uh, loaded uh, container ships, aircraft carriers, cruise ships, very big ships. Uh, to add to the point, the U.S. has only one operational icebreaker, and even that is rather old and temperamental. In large part, then, what our current resolution may suggest is developing greater military capacities in Alaska. And a geographic note, the Aleutian Islands, which extend from Alaska and deep through the Bering Sea, nearly to Russia's Kamchatka Peninsula, the Aleutian Islands. Next, the Canadian Arctic. Uh, this is defined by the Canadian Archipelago, the cluster of over 36,000 islands 
through which the Northwest Passage runs. Canada's inf Arctic infrastructure is also minimally developed, although given its large coastline, it does place more focus on the Arctic than the U.S. For example, it has 18 operational icebreakers to the U.S.'s one. Still, northern Canada is even more sparsely populated than Alaska, with the three northernmost provinces having a combined population of less than 150,000 people. The Atlantic Arctic, uh, the Atlantic Ocean is the largest pathway from the Arctic waters to the open ocean, as the Pacific Arctic's Bering Strait is nearly closed where Alaska approaches Russia. The dominant feature here in the Atlantic is Greenland, a territory of Denmark, uh, along with Iceland. Uh, the Gyu Gap, not sure how to pronounce this, something like that, is a strategically important gap between the Barents Sea above Russia, where much of its navy and nuclear forces are stationed, and the Atlantic Ocean. Next, the European Arctic, which is home to the greatest number of Arctic countries, uh, including Norway, Denmark, remember Denmark owns Greenland, uh, Finland, and Sweden. Although the latter two, Finland and Sweden, don't have coasts on the Arctic Ocean, they both have territory in the Arctic Circle, just a little bit of peace, which give them access to the Arctic Club. Norway has two strategic holdings north of Europe, Svalbard, deep into the Arctic, and a small island between Svalbard and mainland Norway called Bear Island, which is honestly too small to put on this map, but it does exist. The Russian Arctic is the largest section of the Arctic by far, making the Arctic both an incredible opportunity for Russia as well as a vulnerability, given the massive northern coastline that it must defend. Its Arctic coastline stretches into deep Siberia, where its Pacific coastline begins itself stretching down to northern China and North Korea. The Pacific Arctic uh, is where the Chukchi Sea gives way to the Bering Sea through the Bering Strait. This is, again, where Russia meets Alaska. Before moving on, a few important notes on climate change. Again, warming global temperatures are causing the polar ice caps to melt. In the Arctic, this is giving way to more open water. Global warming creates a number of positive feedback loops where the warming causes even further warming. The melting of the ice caps is one, as white ice reflects much of the sun's energy, but naked water will absorb much more of it. And the Arctic is warming four times faster than the rest of the planet, meaning this process is happening fast. As the Arctic warms, it also melts permafrost, ground that's been frozen in some cases for tens of thousands of years. As it melts, gas pockets are released, sometimes exploding, infrastructure that was resting on the frozen ground crumbles, and the structural integrity of both solid ground and ecosystems is disrupted. The thawing carbon is yet another positive feedback loop, with thawing permafrost releasing enormous amounts of greenhouse gases. This is hitting Russia especially hard. This is from Burke 21, quote, Permafrost covers about two-thirds of Russia, including the location of about 80% of Russia's gas industry. One study estimates that permafrost melt will affect 20% of all infrastructure assets in Russia, and more than 50% of all residential structures in the region in the next few decades, at a cost of over $100 billion, end quote. However, as the Arctic Sea opens, its geopolitical influence grows, hence why we are talking about it. As we've mentioned, shipping lanes will continue to open up on the Canadian and Russian coasts, but also beyond. Here is Watts 19, quote, The climate crisis is intensifying a new military buildup in the Arctic as regional powers attempt to secure northern borders that were until recently reinforced by a continental-sized division of ice. That so-called unpaid century is now literally melting away, open up shipping lanes and geosecurity challenges. The Arctic is heating up twice as fast as the rest of the planet, shrinking sea ice and exposing more water and territory to explo exploitation and access. End quote. So this receding ice exposes deposits of oil, gas, and minerals worth trillions of dollars. That's Pedroza 13. 
that any country who can will want a piece of. It will also open up fisheries, not least of which because fish stocks that had previously existed in more southern waters have begun migrating north to escape the heating ocean. In short, the, geopolit the geopolitics of the Arctic, like so many stories of this century, is the story of the warming planet. Now, countries. Starting with U.S. and Canada. The U.S. and Canada are close militarily, economically, and politically. This is a good thing, because they share the world's largest international land border, and apropos to this topic, an Arctic border as well. NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, was created in 1958, primarily as an early warning system for nuclear attacks coming over the Arctic. Since then, its mission has expanded to include both smaller aircraft entering U.S. and Canadian airspace and the internal airspace of North America rather than just its borders. Now, the two countries clearly have different levels of claim to the Arctic. Canada has, by one estimate, 20 times the length of Arctic coast that the U.S. has. This leads to different strategic approaches toward the Arctic. For Canada, much like for Russia, the Arctic is the domain of the countries nearest to it. For the U.S., much like for China, the Arctic should be the shared domain of all humanity to be protected and used by any country that wishes to use it. Again, Pizarre 19. China also promotes a vision of the Arctic as belonging to all mankind. Its goals, as stated in its Arctic policy, are to ultimately safeguard the common interests of all countries and the international community in the Arctic. End quote. The U.S., has a specific national strategy for the Arctic, released by the Biden White House to replace the 2013 Arctic strategy and meant to guide the country for 10 years. It highlights security, climate change, economic development, and international cooperation as areas of focus, and five principles to help guide it, deepening allied relationships, planning for long investment, and others. During these months, we will debate what the U.S should do in the Arctic. But if you want to know what the U.S. will do in actual fact, the national strategy for the Arctic is as good a prediction as you're likely to get. Again, Northern Europe has the greatest number of Arctic countries, including Finland and Sweden, whose territory lies in the Arctic Circle, despite having no Arctic coasts, and Denmark, whose massive territory, Greenland, admits it into the Arctic Club. These countries, plus the U.S., form the Arctic Seven. The Arctic Council of eight Arctic countries, minus Russia, whose invasion of Ukraine effectively halted cooperation in the governing body. All seven members of the Arctic Seven are NATO members, or in the case of Sweden, almost NATO members, with Sweden slated to join the alliance later this year. As we saw before, territories like Greenland and Svalbard give these countries the potential to project power both military and otherwise, deep into the Arctic Sea. The Russian Arctic, also called the AZRF, or Arctic Zone of the Russian Federation, is the longest, most well-developed, most used, and most strategically important stretch of the Arctic. The Arctic is also of extreme importance to Russia and its president. This is from Conley et al. 20. Russian President Vladimir Putin personally identifies with Russian Ar Ar Russia's Arctic ambitions and seeks to exploit the Arctic narrative of man conquering nature as a distinctive feature of modern Russian nationalism. The Arctic is a pillar of Russia's return to great power status. Russia's military presence in the Arctic seeks to achieve uh, several objectives, including create a staging ground to project power primarily in the North Atlantic. The region is essential to Russia's future economic and military vitality." End quote. So, Russia divides its Arctic into eastern and western regions. The western region, near to Europe and hosting much of its northern fleet, uh, including its mi uh, nuclear missile forces, being the more important. Russia's bastion is an advanced, modern, uh, anti-access air de area denial system defending its Arctic coast, making it nearly impossible for enemy ships and submarines from operating near its coast, and employs ships electronic warfare, and a variety of missiles, including the Bastion P, a mobile anti-ship and surface-to-surface -surface missile system. 
Now, for others, starting, of course, with China, you might imagine that, given that China is not an Arctic country, we wouldn't be hearing about them this time. If you imagine that, you may have forgotten that China is indeed China. In 2018, Beijing declared itself a near-Arctic state. Indeed, China has invested massive amounts of regional infrastructure, mostly through Russia. Uh, much of this infrastructure is dual use. So it's scientific or commercial in nature, but easily co-opted for military purposes. A number of other countries have expressed interest in the Arctic through mapping, uh, scientific map missions, exploration, and have stated a desire to uh, uh, engage in resource extraction and shipping through the Arctic Circle. Thirteen states, those listed being amongst them as well as others, have observer status in the Arctic Council. Okay, next a brief discussion of the status quo of laws and governance of the Arctic. In 1987, Mikhail Gorbachev launched his Murmansk Initiative, a series of policy proposals to enshrine the Arctic as a nuclear-free zone and to foster peace and collaboration in the Arctic, much like the Artemis Accords aim to do with the moon. But like the moon, a wish for peace and cooperation is ultimately just a wish. As the Arctic warms and exposes the resources and shipping lanes underneath, the temptation to use the Arctic for other means only grows. Until recently, claiming Arctic territory has been a non-issue, as nobody had any real use for the ice-covered waters. However, a new Arctic uncovers uh, new opportunities. As the ice turns to sea, the rules set out in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea come into play to be followed or to be broken. For those super seniors in your fifth year of debate, you'll remember the 2018 September topic. For the rest of you, a brief refresher. According to Unclose, each, territory, each country has a 12-mile territorial sea, which they can claim as theirs. Nobody else is allowed inside. Each country also has a 200-mile exclusive economic zone, or EEZ, Although anyone is allowed in these waters, the country in question has sole rights to use natural resources like fish and oil. However, UNCLOSE also allows countries to file a claim uh, to the seabed under the ocean beyond the 200 mile EEZ if their continental shelf extends past it. This is a rather odd provision, but one that several countries, including Russia, Norway, Iceland, and Denmark, have taken advantage of by launching seabed surveys to confirm where their continental shelf ends and filing claims to that territory. Russia uses a similar technicality, the so-called ICE Clause of Unclosed Article 234, which stipulates that countries can exercise control over the ice-covered regions if their EEZ, uh, of their EEZ to essentially claim dominance over the whole thing, including charging fees and tolls for ships that want to use it. And this is exclusive to Russia. Only Russia um, is dominating the EEZ. Uh, it's, it's EEZ in this way. Uh, the ICE Clause originally, under UNCLOSE, is really for safety reasons. Uh, countries might have to exert control over the ice-covered waters just because it's a very dangerous area to operate in. Uh, but Russia is making full, uh, taking full advantage of the law as it can. It is worth noting also, that the U.S. has not ratified on close since we uh, debated exactly that five years ago. Some people continue to say it should. So, Canada, similarly, like Russia, claims the areas of waters between its archipelago islands as internal waters, and therefore solely under its own control, despite the fact that, according to UNCLOSE, the vast majority of these waters are international waters. It shouldn't be surprising that claims to the Arctic by the eight countries are overlapped and disputed, and that the nature of the claims, including if and how they can be enforced, is in constant flux. Next, the Arctic Council. We've already mentioned it several times. The Arctic Council is composed of the eight countries with territory in the Arctic Circle. The Council also includes indigenous permanent participants, currently six, all organizations that represent various indigenous peoples, including Inuit, Gwich'in, Sami, Athabaskan, and others. 
Russia chaired the council from 2021 through this year, when Norway took over its chairmanship. However, after the 2022 Ukrainian invasion, uh, the other member nations declared that they would cease attending meetings, bringing cooperation to a halt. Since then, the seven countries have re-engaged in a limited number of Arctic projects that don't involve Russia. So far, there is one binding agreement that the Council has agreed to, the Arctic Search and Rescue Agreement, which delegates zones of responsibility for which each country is uh, obliged to make rescues. And you can see on this map in particular the tiny areas that Finland and Sweden actually claim in the Arctic Circle. Um, those are the areas that they are obliged to make rescues in. Other countries have larger areas. Last, freedom of navigation patrols, or FONAPs, are military operations through international air and water to assert their right to navigate and operate in accordance with international law in waters and airspace that may be subject to excessive maritime claims. These patrols are famously conducted by the U.S. and its allies, for example, through the South China Sea and the Taiwan Strait, but also carried out by Russia, China, and other nations for similar reasons. Essentially, there's some water that one country is dominating, for example, building military bases near, and the U.S. is like, nope, that's international water. We're going to sail a ship through just to prove that you can't claim this area. As a side note, it may seem strange that the U.S. invokes UNCLOSE uh, in its phone apps, despite not having ratified the convention. But for the greatest military power in human history, law, or lack of law, is a simple technicality. These patrols may become an increasingly important tool in determining which claims can be made on Arctic waters, um, and which of those claims can actually be defended. Because just because you want to claim something doesn't mean you can. You really do need military might to turn that into a reality, at least in many cases. Okay, that is your background. I'm fuzzy. Let's stay fuzzy. Uh, AF. So, starting with the status quo, what are we looking at? Uh, for many policy topics, uh, the po the, there's a change that's proposed in the resolution. In that case, AF uh, must show that the status quo is untenable, that the status quo needs to be changed, and that is indeed what AF is doing here. So the AF must show that the uh, substantial increase of the U.S. military presence in the Arctic is really necessary to keep the Arctic a uh, good place. Here's Smith 21 on the idea of Arctic exceptionalism, that the Arctic can remain forever peaceful and free from militarization. Quote, It is increasingly apparent that this notion, since Gorbachev first gave voice to it, has always been based on wishful thinking. To the degree that there has been any exceptionalism inherent to the Arctic, this was not due to political restraint or mutual agreement, but rather because it's really difficult to conduct operations in the northernmost region of the globe. In reality, the Arctic is no different than any other region and not exempt from contest or conflict. AF here would be wise to internalize this fact. The Arctic may have been a place set apart, but this reality has already crumbled. If the U.S. already had a strong Arctic presence, this change would not be necessary. Sadly, it does not. First, its goal of security. Why care about military deficits at all? The Arctic presents a big enough vulnerability and opportunity that the U.S., Chinese, and Russian governments, among others, have all prioritized its development. Here's Maldine and Cullison 23 on the U.S.'s posture. Quote, the Biden administration released a new Arctic strategy in October that identified national security as the main pillar for U.S. interests in the region, ahead of the environmental, economic development, and international cooperation. Then, uh, Senator Roger Wicker, the top Republican on the Senate Armed Forces Committee, is quoted here. Both Putin and Xi have made clear that the high north is key to their strategic interests and it is imperative that the U.S. and our allies keep them from dominating this region." End quote. One oft-discussed capability deficit is the U.S.'s lack of icebreakers. 
ships with hardened hulls that can make their way through ice without damage. These ships are necessary to maintain a presence in the ice-covered Arctic, but no less so in the ice-covered Antarctic Ocean. China, a self-declared near-Arctic nation some 1,500 kilometers from the Arctic Circle, already has two brand new Snow Dragon icebreakers, with more on the way. Watts19 says that, The U.S., by comparison, is lagging behind. Its surface navy is ill-equipped for the Arctic. Everyone's up here but us, the Navy Secretary Richard Spencer complained. End quote. Russia, it should come as no surprise, is even better equipped, with about 24 active icebreakers, with seven being nuclear-powered and three more nuclear-powered icebreakers on the way. Again, Moldine and Collison 23. The U.S. is lagging behind Russia in true polar icebreakers, which can break through solid ice several feet thick. The massive ships can bring heavy equipment, fuel, and supplies through thick sea ice, anywhere from research stations in Antarctica to the North Pole, while also monitoring radio transmissions and shipping. End quote. How many icebreakers does the U.S. have? Only two. Of the two, only one is active. The other is simply a spare parts depot for the active one. And even the active one is not available year-round, as maintenance takes it out of commission for part of the year. If the U.S. wants any hope of competing in the Arctic, it needs more icebreakers. As a counterpoint, both Larder 20 and especially AV-19 make great arguments that more icebreaker investment isn't actually needed. Next, the Northwest Passage. This represents, again, a major vulnerability of the North American continent to both Chinese and Russian incursions. Although most of the coast is theoretically controlled by Canada, the Canadian military is ill-equipped to rise to the challenge. Here's Kosnik 20. Currently, Canada spends only 1.29% of GDP on defense. The Canadian Armed Forces is also suffering from a crisis in hardware capacity. Canada's Navy is outdated. Canada's one dedicated naval replenishment ship lacks naval-grade radars or a self-defense system. Despite these pressures, a drastic increase in military spending appears unlikely. Kosnick also proposes a solution, one that could work as an affirmative case. The U.S. team up with Canada to patrol the passage. As both countries lack significant polar capabilities, teaming up could help to make best use of their limited resources. Quote, Again from Kosnick, forming a bilateral maritime pass, uh, command of the Northwest Passage could resolve both Canadian and U.S. concerns about international maritime travel in the Arctic. In an era when U.S. and Canadian relations with China are at an all-time low, a bilateral agreement can prevent China from exploiting this silent dispute within the Canada-U.S. alliance. End quote. A related solution involves upgrading NORAD, a relatively ancient alert system that many suggest needs an upgrade, and that to some degree is already receiving those upgrades, but that nevertheless holds fertile ground for the affirmative team. Okay, solvency. How can we fix this issue of U.S. military deficit in the Arctic? We've already addressed uh, two proposed solutions, expanding our icebreaker fleet and forming a joint Arctic partnership with Canada, potentially upgrading NORAD, there are three further areas where the U.S. both lacks presence and can easily expand to fill this strategic void. First, allies. Tingstan and Stavitz, 22, quote, The U.S. might do well to focus more on U.S. ally and partnership capabilities in the region. The U.S. has friends in high places in the Arctic, including NATO allies, end quote. This might include Canada or any of the other six U.S. military-allied Arctic countries. As Russia and China's ambition grows, the U.S. should ca capitalize on its larger strength. Next, weapons. The Arctic is a harsh and unforgiving environment. As such, special weapons are needed to defend the coastline. Weapons of the U.S. would do well to further acquire and further develop. Matthew Bolagu Bola, 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 specializes in Eurasian security and defense issues with a focus on Russian foreign policy and military affairs. He writes extensively and well about the Arctic, and we will quote him throughout this lecture, starting now with his recommendations for U.S. weaponization and improvements. Quote, 
Arctic partners must invest in cold weather enabled, enabling and polar specific capabilities that contest Russia's sense of military superiority in the region. This should include MDA, S ASW, and mine countermeasure capabilities, and maritime patrol aviation, as well as hardening military infrastructure and systems against Russian electronic warfare, end quote. Last, capabilities, generally speaking. These include the integration and training on other military technologies and dual-use technologies, not just weapons. Dr. Katarina Zisk is a professor of international relations and contemporary history at the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies in Oslo. Here is her take on capabilities the U.S. Navy might improve upon. Quote, this includes manned and unmanned operational presence and patrol options, necessary investments in infrastructure and critical research and development, including cold weather capable designs, improved weather modeling, and resilient, survivable, and interoperable command, control, computers, communications, cyber intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities. Huge list of things that we could improve on. Clearly, reaching this substantial threshold needed by the resolution should be a non-issue with only a portion of these investments. And lastly, number four out of three, not on the slides, this is a secret bonus capability the US can improve on, uh, surveillance. Surveillance can give the US situational awareness of the far north without escalating tensions in the same way a large military presence or missile buildup might do. Here's Gersten Rogers 21, in a piece about Iceland surveillance improvements in Greenland, quote, Without proper situational awareness in the Arctic, the dynamics of information asymmetry could escalate tensions further, with a high chance of misunderstanding, uh, miscalculation and misunderstanding. As the Danish defense minister has argued, the increased surveillance capabilities should be seen as a contribution to de-escalation. Okay, here are the issues the U.S. has and some of the many ways it could be improved. Here's a guy on a snowmobile. Competition. We know that the US military has massive deficits in the Arctic, but compared to what? We'll break this section into three parts. Russia, China, and the Russian-China alliance. Again, Russia is the undisputed Arctic power. In a way, the US will likely never achieve. Its massive Arctic coastline, more than half of the total Arctic Circle, its decades of investments in the region, and its importance to Russian identity means that Russia is many steps ahead in ruling the Arctic. Now, there is an argument that this military buildup is defensive. After all, the Arctic represents a vulnerability as well as an opportunity. ZISC-22 puts this notion to bed. The distinction between offense and defense is not clear-cut in Russian strategic thinking. Russia has also conducted numerous operations in the Arctic that can qualify as provocative or threatening to other countries, claiming that Russian Arctic military investments are primarily designed to protect cr crucial economic and security infrastructure does not preclude offensive use of these capabilities. The Arctic is strategically intertwined with other security spaces in Russian thinking." End quote. Between its size, its capabilities, and most importantly, its will, as evidenced by the Ukraine war, uh, this all means that Russia will continue to be the U.S.'s main focus in the Arctic. Now, as much as the big bad bear narrative fits U.S. propaganda needs, there are convincing reasons not to believe them, according to both Conley et al. 20 and Buchanan 23. Next, China. But first, a little picture. Yo! China, as in every arena, plays its hand more softly than Russia. And the case for China posing a military threat in the region is weaker. But that doesn't mean it's less dangerous. China's approach to the Northern Pole is twofold, scientific and commercial. With the close integration of the PLA, China's military, into all aspects of Chinese government, however, um, both fields science and investment, give China's military a foothold in the Arctic. First on science, China is involved in scientific programs at both poles, but its projects in Arctic countries continue to be rebuffed 
as the world grows increasingly skeptical of its intentions. Funol at All 23, quote, The connections between China's polar research programs and the PLA have raised alarms about the potential security risks in the Arctic. Over the past decade, several Chinese efforts have been blocked or rescinded by Arctic states for national security reasons, end quote. The table in this card, by the way, uh, Funol et al. 23, lists five projects China has been blocked from across Sweden, Greenland, and Finland, all for security uh, concerns. They continue. China's own strategic writings makes clear that the PLA has its sights on the region. The dual-use nature of Arctic research epitomizes China's military-civil fusion strategy, which aims to marshal civilian resources to support the PLA. End quote. And investment. Of course, although China, uh, by some metrics, is now the leading producer of science, by good metrics, I mean, they are, it's even more famous as a commercial center. Cutting weeks off the trip between Asia and Europe is a major incentive for Chinese investment in the region, and the Arctic is no exception to its famous Belt and Road Initiative. Yo, I'm not fuzzy anymore. Um, all up to the whims of this webcam, I suppose. Here's Perez 20 on China's investment in the Arctic. China is by far the largest foreign investor in the region, investing $1.4 trillion into the Arctic across a wide range of sectors. While other countries have made major investments in the Arctic, China is by far the most active, with 884 projects. End quote. Now, China doesn't necessarily have to be scary, and the evidence pack has three cards that rebut this point. Sealand and Havness 20... Is that what it is? Yeah. Pizar 19 and Buchanan and Strading 20. Okay. We've talked about Russia, we've talked about China, but you cannot forget the iconic Russian-China duo. Again, Fuenol at all 23. The war in Ukraine has left China, uh, Russia increasingly isolated and reliant on China for crucial investments in technology and infrastructure. Chinese scholars have previously analyzed how best to gain a foothold in the Russian Arctic in 2019, Prominent academics from the Chinese Academy of Sciences at Fuzhou University conducted a study to identify which Russian ports along the strategic Northern Sea Route hold the greatest potential for facilitating Chinese access to the region, end quote. And Gordon Youssef, 23, on a recent headline in early August that likely interrupted a number of public forum camps on this exact topic, quote, a combined Russian and Chinese naval force patrolled near the coast of Alaska last week in what U.S. experts said appeared to be the largest such flotilla to approach American shores. Eleven Russian ships, uh, Russian and Chinese ships steamed close to the, to the Aleutian Islands. Given the context of the war in Ukraine and tensions around Taiwan, this move is highly provocative. End quote. So, if you need a reason why we're talking about this now rather than next year or last year... Um, that wasn't really planned, but it was um, timely for Russia and China to make their largest naval incursion into, let's say, near American waters. Um, uh, of course, this partnership between the two may be one of convenience and necessity more than a camaraderie and... Bulagu22, I think that's the third way I pronounce this guy's name, makes je just this point in the AT China Russia card. Next, for pro resources. Last for pro resources. Due to the harsh conditions and permanent ice sheet, Natural resources in the Arctic have gone almost entirely unexploited, meaning that the Arctic gold rush is primed to begin. Are we getting fuzzy again? Come on, camera. Come on, camera. Nah, okay. So we first need, before we talk about resources, a link. Because, okay, there's resources, who cares? Why does that mean we have to send our military there? So let's link. Large resources might require commercial presence rather than military presence, and while it might be intuitive, why you would need the military presence um, in claiming the resources in debate, we must be explicit about this fact. Masters 19, quote, The U.S. is one of only a handful of countries to have a so-called blue water navy, which can operate across the open ocean. 
Sea Control provides a freedom of action that is required for the pursuit of other objectives, such as shipping protection. It protects seaboard commerce, some 90% of global trade travels by ship, and generally maintains order at sea. And... Eagle in 15. The U.S. Navy Marine Corps Coast Guard team keeps the seas open and free. The presence of gray-hulled U.S. flagged ships underpins $4.6 trillion of waterborne commerce. Each dollar spent on the U.S. Navy returns $30 for the economic well-being of the United States. End quote. When constructing a case around resources, this link to the absolute necessity of U.S. military protection, protection will be crucial. The impacts are hard to dispute, so this link will be the obvious point of attack, although many of the impacts will be easy to turn as well. So, we need the military. I'm not using these pictures well, but here are some dudes. Hydrocarbons. Gas and oil deposits will be the main moneymaker in the region. For Site 18 puts 13% of undiscovered oil and 30% of undiscovered gas reserves in the Arctic. Paris 20 puts 20% of undiscovered petroleum reserves there, with 19 major oil and gas companies now active in the Arctic. They also state of the competition that, quote, for Russia, natural gas represents the backbone of its economic and geopolitical future, end quote. Minerals. Rare earth minerals may be abundant in the region. They're rare on earth, hence the name. So anywhere we can find it is important. Again, Paris 20. For the U.S., there is potential to access a range of resources, including critical minerals such as rare earths, copper, and phosphorus, end quote. Some of these minerals are crucial for advanced technologies like microchips as well as military hardware. Others like phosphorus are important for farming and food production, which has been a focus of several great cases I've heard on past topics. So a phosphorus case, not a bad thing to consider. Given how crucial these minerals are, how fast the world is running out, and how reliant the U.S. and other countries, um, how reliant the U.S. is on other countries for these minerals and resources, I expect minerals uh, cases to make a decent minority of Arctic cases. Shipping. Shipping is no less uh, no less important resource, um, and it is again opening up. This is particularly the case for Russia's Northeast Passage. Yet again, thank you, Paris 20. Quote, Melting ice is also freeing up new shipping routes across Asia, Europe, and the U.S., cutting down average shipping times between Europe and Asia from 37 days to 22, and shipping times from the U.S. to Asia from 43 days to 32. Several key waterways, including the Suez Canal in the Middle East, the Panama Canal in South America, the Strait of Malacca in Asia, handle a huge portion of global shipping traffic. However, as the 2021 Suez Canal debacle showed, these shipping lanes are not always reliable and are subject to any number of obstructions, accidents, or intentional shutdowns. The shipping lanes provided by the Arctic make these few pathways less a liability to global commerce and will give those that control them great economic and political sway. In addition, shipping routes will be exploited by criminals if countries like the U.S. are unable to secure the region. So here is Cretius et al. 21. With increased traffic in these water... Ooh, hoo, hoo, we're still talking about shipping. With increased... No, we're talking about crime. Uh, with increased traffic in these waterways, Arctic states will have to find some way of monitoring unknown ships and activity. If not, the Arctic may see an increase in illegal fishing and trafficking. This indicates that Arctic states, particularly Canada and Russia, must determine better ways of controlling their northern borders. Although not the highest impact argument, the crime patrol angle sidesteps much of NEG's defense on escalation, military critiques, and environmental protection, and therefore might be an interesting approach to the topic for affirmative. Last, territory. Well, it might seem counterintuitive counterintuitive that territory could be an issue in a place without land, as we've discussed, there are already a great number of overlapping claims to the Arctic. While the disputes can hopefully be peacefully resolved, others will doubtlessly be established through a strong military presence. Bullock U-22 details Russia's claims to the Northern Sea Route, and Schreiber-19 explains how both Russia 
and Canada's claims to Arctic territory will grow increasingly shaky with the melting ice. Okay, listen. The facts are clear. The U.S. military is drastically behind its global competitors in the Arctic, an increasingly important region for resource extraction and shipping lanes. If the U.S. wants to maintain security, as the Biden administration has laid out as a top priority, we need to invest in the many areas we're lacking in. Icebreakers, Northwest Passage security, Arctic-based weapons, military capabilities, and surveillance. Any single one of these would necessitate a substantial increase. And that gives the judge plenty of reasons to vote AF. Now, of course, neg. Starting off with the status quo and why it's so, so good. Again, the negative team defends the status quo. In this case, there are three basic approaches to this um, that I could come up with anyway. Um, first, the Arctic is a special place that should not be encroached upon by the military. Second, that our network of allies makes the status quo already very secure. And third, a critique of the actor, that if there are changes needed in the Arctic, it should not be the U.S. federal government that makes those changes. So, I will start by saying that I don't think the Arctic exceptionalism argument is great. Um, but it could form a refrain or framework as part of a neg case. The Arctic has, so far, due to simple geographic conditions, remained free from militarization. However, an increased U.S. military presence will throw the status quo... Uh, turning Arctic into another dangerous flashpoint, increasing the risk of escalation and erasing one of the final non-militarized areas on the planet. Has Russia already begun the process of Arctic militarization? Sure, but look at a map and you will immediately know why. A U.S. Arctic, a US Arctic militarization is different in a class of its own and poorly advised given the Arctic's exceptional nature. So... You can hold on to this Arctic exceptionalism. If we have something good, why make it worse? Allies. A stronger argument concerns U.S. allies. Of the eight Arctic nations, seven are military allies. The U.S. itself, therefore, does not need to ramp up its own military presence, although topicality might be an issue in constructing this argument. Again, ZISC-21, quote, do we have a picture? Yeah. Quote, Alliances and partnerships in the region have been highlighted in the U.S. Arctic policy documents over the years as, uh, Arct U.S. Arctic policy documents over the years as the greatest strategic asymmetric advantage over rivals in the region and therefore the cornerstone of regional strategy. Such steps are less likely to exacerbate regional tensions than a permanent U.S. military presence and new infrastructure. So, leaning on our allies is both our main strength, something we should continue to lean into, also something that's less likely to exacerbate tensions, less likely to raise the temperature in the Arctic, politically speaking. Indeed, the recent expansion of NATO makes an excellent case against changing the status quo. Here's Locker and Hautala 23, quote, The integration of the highly capable Swedish and Finnish militaries into NATO will itself bolster the alliance's regional defense posture. Sw Finnish and Swedish accession can dramatically increase regional stability. Indeed, some allies are already independently increasing their Arctic abilities. Um, as we said before, we have the Gersted and Rogers 21 car on Denmark doing exactly that, increasing surveillance. Um, here's a further quote. In February 2021, the Danish Minister of Defense announced that the country would invest 1.5 billion DKK, 245 million U.S. dollars in strengthening its defense capabilities in the Arctic. And lastly, NORAD, which deals with the U.S.'s own Arctic coast, Pizarre 19. A key U.S. partner when it comes to monitoring the Arctic for threats is Canada. The U.S. and Canada have cooperated through NORAD since it was established. This cooperation was further enhanced with the 2012 signaling of the Tri-Command Framework for Arctic Cooperation, which promotes more military cooperation in the Arctic between the U.S. and Canada, end quote. So, the U.S.'s largest strategic advantage is its global allies in the Arctic. It's the U.S.'s Arctic allies, and given the capabilities of these Arctic allies, an increasing um, U.S. investment is both unnecessary and subject to the disadvantages that we will talk about shortly. 
last on why the status quo is good, why especially this resolution cannot go forward. Um, this argument is frankly naive, but nevertheless understandable, and in some circuits very convincing, uh, that the future of the Arctic should be left up to the Arctic's indigenous peoples, not the U.S. federal government. Here is Huntington at all 21, quote, Governments of Arctic countries and others affecting the region face the choice of whether to respect the rights of Arctic indigenous peoples or whether to continue to pursue exogenous visions for the region. Unilateral actions to protect and conserve the Arctic contravene the spirit and letter of environmental justice, end quote. And for those who believe that indigenous rights and national defense can go hand in hand, Canada proves that that just is not possible. Quote, if history teaches us anything, this latest push for a military buildup in the far north will line the pockets of domestic arms manufacturers and likely result in de deleterious impacts on indigenous communities and the natural environments al alike. That is Angler 22. Although I don't have a card for it, I am 120% sure that whatever criticisms one could levy against Canadian history as it relates to indigenous peoples could also be levied against the Russian government and its militarization of the Arctic. So again, if you want to make a case, I think there's probably tons and tons and tons of evidence about it. And given the U.S.'s track record with indigenous peoples, I'm sure it's the same. Okay. As with any good debate topic, a long meditation can leave us with deep dread of both nuclear war and climate change. Why would you want to choose just a single dread? As a side note, this topic does avoid an easy loop into AI, but computer servers do require cooling, so maybe there's a way. Uh, first, military damage. A military buildup anywhere, but the Arctic is no exception, is bad for climate change. Carliner 22 talks about prioritizing greenhouse gas emissions over militarization. Quote, the U.S. military buildup in the Arctic threatens to exacerbate climate change. The DOD is the world's largest institutional user of petroleum and correspondingly the single largest institutional producer of greenhouse gases in the world. Increased military activities in the Arctic are likely to result in increased emissions. Climate change is a much more urgent and ultimately existential threat compared to these short-term concerns about showing the flag. End quote. Engler 22 talks about the environmental degradation, destruction... Um, that accompanies militarization with the DEW, or Distant Early Warning Line, a, a now-abandoned radar system in northern Canada. Quote, When the DEW line was abandoned a few years after being completed, an incredible amount of material was left behind. There were rotted vehicles and lakes, containers full of hazardous materials, and dumps leading arsenic, leaking arsenic and PCBs, harmful industrial chemicals, 1,000 kilometers south of the DEW line, Nearly 100 mid-Canada line radar sites spilled PCBs and other toxic substances for decades. End quote. In addition, any development of the Arctic, military or non-military, is bad for the environment. The horrors coming for the Arctic are mostly commercial in nature, over fishing, oil spills, and the ravages of deep sea mining. Inasmuch as the military helps to potentiate these commercial interests, this uh, militarization is also a bad thing. Like, do we need the military to protect commercial interests? We shouldn't have commercial interests. They shouldn't be protected. Therefore, we should not militarize. So, whether directly related to climate change or not, Arctic militarization is bad news for the environment. Can you believe I've been doing these lectures for three years and I still don't know how a camera works? Anyway, this is fun. Let's get some, uh, some variety in the video. Uh, okay. Okay. Opportunity costs. A likely larger issue with climate change is the opportunity costs that military investment brings. There's not an unlimited amount of money and resources, so choosing to invest in the military means we're not investing in other areas. And the most pressing issue for investment now is climate change. Quote from Burke 21, Because an ice-free Arctic means that the worst effects of climate change are upon us, it will mean a dramatically changing and likely unstable landscape in the Arctic. Moreover, changes in the Arctic will presage and feed changes all over the world. A fleet of icebreakers, which cost around a billion dollars a pop, will not be of much help for floods and fires in the lower 48. The Arctic has the potential to be a gigantic money pit, 
And if American policymakers do not take climate change into account, they may find that they have spent money on the wrong things at a time when the opportunity costs are brutally high. End quote. The largest stock issue, to my mind anyway, and therefore one of the most straightforward and heavy-hitting arguments for the NEG team, is the prospect of war. Military investment in the Arctic will almost certainly increase the chance of war. The internet has been waiting for the third installment to drop, and we don't want more flashpoints. So, let's talk war. First, the fact that Russia is, geopolitically speaking, vulnerable. Despite objections to this claim that AF might levy, the Kremlin, at minimum, believes it to be true. Bologu22, Matthew, I pray to God you don't watch this video. Quote, In Moscow's calculations, sea ice no longer acts as a natural border in the Arctic. The impacts of climate change and increased human activity on Russia's European Arctic have increased a new de facto border and maritime boundary that require both perimeter control and the enforcement of sovereignty beyond the AZRF. Military tensions in the Arctic are slowly building around demonstrations of access and presence. Such activities are likely to multiply in the short term, potentially leading to an ex escalatory dynamic between Russia and NATO partners and allies. From Russia's point of view, Western-led operations of the Arctic and Antarctica encourage the Kremlin's self-constructed perception of encirclement by NATO and U.S. forces and consequent remilitarization of both regions. Moscow believes that such activity must be met with a strong response, which increases the risk of escalation in the North Pacific. End quote. Yo. Tension. Let's keep talking about war, shall we? These dudes with guns. The tension that Russia feels over its increasing Arctic vulnerability is getting worse. Bulagu 22 continues, quote, Russia's policies for the polar regions overlap and are increasingly becoming militarized as the perception of threats to Russia's national interest grows. A fear of encirclement by NATO and its allies informs this posture, heightened and worsening relations with the West over Russia's renewed war against Ukraine and potential NATO expansion. And NATO's recent addition of two of Russia's neighbors doesn't make matters any better. Locker and Hautala, 23. With Finland and Sweden in NATO, Russia's northern northwestern flank becomes more vulnerable. Its border with the alliance will then extend from the Arctic Ocean to the Baltic Sea, which will become almost entirely ringed by NATO countries. End quote. Last instability. Importantly, and obviously, U.S. military development in the Arctic will heighten tensions, increase Russian fears, and create even greater regional instability. Here is Tipo 21. Quote, the deployment of offensive weapon systems and mutually provocative postures reinforces mistrust and vulnerability that leads states towards closing the gaps to enhance security, paradoxically creating further instability globally and potentially in the Arctic. End quote. Now, I won't impact this argument out, but it wouldn't be hard to do. Observers already see war with Russia on the horizon. And the last thing we need to do is destabilize Russia's vulnerable north coast, pushing their paranoid, and rightly so, leadership into a corner. Last for Neg. This is the price you pay for experimenting with new video techniques. I will pay that price. Diplomacy. Uh, in a renewed nuclear age, with geopolitical tension on the rise, now is not the time for increased militarization. Instead, the tools of diplomacy are better suited to preserve peace in the Arctic. And, in fact, to forward the goals of the United States. It may sound naive, but with so much on the line, we actually need greater cooperation with all of the world's nations. Here's Devyatkin 21, quote, There's substantial and ongoing support in the international scientific community for Moscow and Washington to find a common understanding in tackling the climate crisis. The Arctic, warming at nearly three times the global average, should be the first place of attention. And, Bulagu and Tebledge 21, quote, it is paramount that a new dialogue begins on how to collectively address the role um, and place of defense-related hard security and military issues crafted in such a way 
as to once again insulate the Arctic from geopolitical tensions elsewhere. The ultimate goal is to decrease the risk of miscalculation and escalation through predictability and transparency." End quote. Now, of course, both these articles were pre-Ukraine war. The same author, Bolagu, has an article from 2022, you can find it under AT Diplomacy, which makes quite a different point. And the Biden administration's post-Ukraine handbook on the Arctic also explicitly states there will be no cooperation with Russia. Still, we are here doing public forum to discuss not what the government will do, but instead what the U.S. government should do. Next, the Arctic Council. You may ask what forum might be appropriate to manage the Arctic, and of course the answer is the forum specifically designed for Arctic diplomacy. Despite Russia being elbowed out of cooperation, the Council lives on. Here is Tingstad and Perez, 23, quote, Despite the current uncertainties, there could be ways to move past the stalemate between Russia and the other council members. The absence of cooperation between the West and Russia is already being felt acutely in various areas key to Arctic survival and well-being that have benefited from international cooperation. Activities should be handled as much as possible at the operational rather than the political level. In other words, the Arctic activities that will bring stability and sustainability and peace to the region uh, should be carried out, regardless of the top-level political interactions between involved countries. It makes sense that the U.S., the, the government, uh, the world, the populace is pissed off at Russia. That doesn't mean that the things that we need to cooperate on are any less important. It doesn't mean that the solution to military is more military. Uh, finally, the issue of Northwest Passage defense, crucial to the U.S., can be handled without resorting to militarization. As we've said, Canada views the water between its northern islands as its own. For the U.S., recognizing Canada's view would give its northern neighbor far more latitude to patrol these waters and protect the North American continent. Here is LeBlanc 20, LeBlanc 20, quote, The Arctic's capability... Uh, the Arctic's capacity as a strategic buffer is eroding rapidly, with the disappearance of ice making it an avenue of threat to the U.S. homeland. With the power competition between China, Russia, and the U.S. growing in the Arctic, it may be wise for the latter to recognize the Northwest Passage as internal waters of Canada. This would deny the right of transit to China and Russia, not only on the surface of the passage, but also for the air column above and the waters below. Uh, all great alternatives to the U.S. simply unilaterally pushing into the Arctic further militarily. To sum it up, there are a great many reasons for the U.S. to refrain from militarizing the Arctic. The status quo, with U.S. allies working together on Arctic awareness, is as good as we will get. Further militarization would gain nothing while risking both increased tensions with Russia and a lack of attention on the planet the environment, and the warming climate. Choose your reason. A vote for the status quo is a vote for a real future for the Arctic and for the world. That's it for your Arctic lecture. Remember that all the evidence mentioned in this video and much more not mentioned in the video is available at debatetrack.com. Thank you for watching. Leave a comment if you liked it. Let me know if you prefer Fuzzy Joel or non-Fuzzy Joel. And remember to be kind to yourself and to those around you. See you next time for November's Topic.